I've been able to create a couple of them myself already, and create some pretty good. So please put that. I'm not surprised. But please. Um, the first paper is due next week. Don't forget that. Uh, so let's give a little bit of a reminder. Um, that's basically it for it. Yes, the paper. 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 The Favorite yeah. um, Before I was here at Miami full time in my previous position, um, auditory processing, um, evaluation, and treatment was probably about 60% of what I did. Um, so it is it's something that I truly, truly um, enjoy doing. And I hope. That it's something that you guys will develop a likeness for as well. Um, before we start discussing it, I should point out a couple of things. Um, auditory processing disorder is somewhat controversial. Despite reams and reams of evidence based research about it, there are still people. Be fairly old school who say that there is no such thing as auditory processing disorder. We have some folks in our department who are kind of of that opinion. Their feeling is that um, there's no such thing as an auditory processing disorder, that all of the signs and symptoms are due to a language processing disorder. <clears throat> and while I agree there are such things as language processing disorder, <coughs> we have to ask ourselves what's causing it. And in many cases, it's, don't know. But if you do a battery of testing <coughs> that's designed to examine the auditory physiology, so look at the function of various parts of the auditory system, and we are finding in the course of that battery of testing that there are abnormalities, then I don't see how we can deny the existence. And like I said, that the evidence-based research is that it is truly a distinct um, and recognizable and diagnosable and treatable disorder. But there are some old school audiologists and some old school speech pathologists who still don't buy into it. That partly explains why um, most school districts, most state departments of education um, do not recognize auditory processing disorder as a qualified condition or an IEP. So even if I evaluate a child and I identify specific deficits in their auditory physiology, but their hearing itself is normal, which technically, um, by definition, it should be in order to be diagnosed with an auditory processing disorder, hearing sensitivity is supposed to be normal. Um, they will say, well, then they don't qualify. So it's, it's somewhat frustrating, and so we typically have to go the route of getting them a 504 plan to be able to know where those are. But basically, an IEP says that they have a condition that places them um, or, or has a, a negative impact on their educational experience. And they typically have to score below a certain percentile or um, within a certain number of standard deviations below the norm in order to qualify for services and it has to have a proven educational impact. Um, whereas for a 504 plan, um, all we have to show is that 
at least one area or one um, essential life function is being impacted. And it doesn't have to have a proven educational impact and they can qualify. So typically, um, kids, if they have been diagnosed with auditory processing disorder, unless they have something like a language disorder diagnosed alongside of it or some learning disability, they're not necessarily going to qualify for 90 minutes. It's slowly changing. Some states are, uh, are starting to come around Florida. I'm glad to say it was one of the first. And they actually have um, a really in-depth um, matrix of interventions and accommodations for students that have auditory processing disorder. And the states that have subsequently changed their, um, their point of view about it have pretty much adopted the Florida matrix. And so it's actually becoming more widespread. I'm hoping that eventually um, more and more states will follow suit because I spent, when I was doing this a lot more, um, I spent a substantial amount of my time um, writing telephoning, attending um, ARC meetings and IEP meetings, fighting and advocating to get these kids the services that they need. Um, I think as we discuss the, uh, the primary characteristics and some of the challenges that individuals with autism <coughs> just want to face, I think you guys will be doing a <coughs> new, why, why is there a debate about this, but there still is. So, in any case, let's talk about what auditory processing is. Auditory processing is what your brain does with what your ear hears. Your ear picks up sound and it transmits it to the brain. But processing is what your brain does with that sound. And in order for your brain to process the sound information, the auditory pathways have to be intact. And so when I do an auditory processing battery, um, I include several tests of auditory physiology. If I see completely normal auditory physiology, it's going to be very difficult for me to say that there's an auditory processing disorder. Um, but the flip side is also true. If I see multiple signs of abnormal auditory physiology, it's going to be very difficult for me to deny the existence of an auditory processing disorder. Um, there isn't any real reliable um, data on how common it is. I think partly because there are still, despite the evidence out there, there's still some debate about what actually should or should not qualify as an auditory processing disorder. So if we're still having some debate about the definition, it's going to be difficult to have um, consistent, reliable data on how often it occurs. We do see, though, in all the data, about a two to one ratio of males to females. That pesky Y chromosome um, tends to cause more problems. Uh, so that is something that you can pretty much take to the bank. Most of the time, we don't know why the person is having an auditory processing disorder. It's idiopathic in most cases. There are cases where we can pinpoint it. A person may have developed um, an acoustic neuroma, a tumor of the auditory nerve. Um, they may have sustained a brain injury. Yeah, there, there may be some known um, diagnosis. We often see auditory processing disorder in individuals who have conditions like MS. But the vast majority of cases are considered idiopathic. We just don't know. Okay? 
we can see in people who have hearing loss, particularly older adults who have hearing loss, we can see symptoms that, are, that mimic those that we encounter with an auditory processing disorder. And a lot of people refer to it as an auditory processing disorder, which I think further muddies the water and feeds into this controversy. But most people, most experts, will define true auditory processing disorder. Um, one of the, the diagnostic criteria is that the person has quote unquote normal or near normal hearing sensitivity. So if you have a hearing problem, of course you're going to have problems with understanding and interpreting what you hear because you're getting a bad signal. So, um, but that's the argument that people use to say, well, then it's an auditory processing problem. So, which kind of first? The chicken or the egg? I don't know. But know that there, that is also part of the controversy. Personally, I'm in the camp that says if we're talking about a true auditory processing disorder, hearing sensitivity is normal. If the person doesn't have normal hearing sensitivity, then it makes sense that they're going to have trouble with how their system handles auditory input. Um, we do know that children who have a significant history of recurrent <coughs> ear infections or recurrent middle ear fluids, so they've had uh, fluctuations in their hearing, they've had sustained or prolonged periods of time when they've been deprived of clear auditory information, the incidence of auditory processing um, impairment in those kids is significantly higher. Um, we also know that, um, like I said, those symptoms of auditory processing are common in the elderly. Remember, how long do most people go from the time that their hearing loss is detected until the time that they opt for intervention, particularly in the form of hearing aids? It's more than seven years, okay? During that seven year time period, if you're talking about an older adult, they're going to have other types of physical and potentially cognitive declines going on. And if you throw on top of that um, isolation and, and a lack of auditory information, what else is probably going to become affected? Memory. You can't remember something if you didn't hear it clearly the first time. Um, social, socialization. If you're not able to participate in group or social activities because you can't hear, you can't selectively attend to the conversation because of all the background noise, you know, that it, it can have a devastating impact on the older adult. Like I said, there can be known conditions like brain injury or uh, neurological conditions. The primary, primary symptom, complaint that we hear is difficulty understanding and noise. Okay? And even if the person has a little bit of hearing loss, their um, discrimination skills are usually disproportionate. So you may have someone that has a minimal hearing loss or even a, you know, maybe a very mild hearing loss, and yet they have extremely poor word discrimination. And then if you add in background noise, it pretty much bottoms out. Okay. So, what we're typically looking for is what's their hearing sensitivity look like? How well are they able to attend to sounds? How well are they able to decode or discriminate what they're hearing? And how well can they attach meaning? So, auditory processing disorders, we refer to it with the plural, S, disorders can take several different forms. You can have um, an auditory association disorder. You can have an auditory perceptual disorder. Um, you can have an input-output disorder. There's lots of different forms that it can take. You can get as specific as you want. But we do know 
that for normal processing to take place, the person should have adequate hearing sensitivity. They should be able to attend to, and particularly selectively attend to sounds. They should be able to decode or discriminate, and they need to be able to form associations and um, understand or attach them. Okay? So the profile that we often see in kids that are suspected of having an auditory processing disorder are that they are described as poor listeners. Teachers and others will say, well, they just don't pay attention. They're, they're poor listeners. Um, these kids, and, and so another diagnostic criteria is that the person has to have a normal IQ. If you have an individual with significant cognitive or intellectual impairment, they're going to have problems with comprehension, with other skills, um, and if they haven't helped them have auditory issues as well, they're going to be at even greater risk, but that's not in and of itself um, a diagnostic criteria for AP. We look for normal IQ, okay? And yet, despite that, they're having academic achievement problems. So these are the kids that teachers will say, oh, well, they, they're not good listeners. They're not working to the level of their capabilities. They're not, um, they're not applying themselves. We know that they're smart. Um, these kids have a high level of distractibility if they're in a difficult listening situation, if they're in a noisy situation. However, if you can remove them to a quiet environment, or if you can modify the environment to make it less of a listening challenge, these kids tend to immediately improve. So that's one of the things that helps us differentiate it from what? KPD. For ADHD, because those kids have problems with attention, focus, and distractibility regardless. It may be visual that sets them off. It may be tactile that sets them off. It may be auditory that, tap that sets them off. It's usually a combination of all of the above. Whereas children with auditory processing disorder, it's the auditory environment that if we can improve or modify that, suddenly these poor listening skills improve and their academic achievement improves. Another thing that we look at, probably one of the most common things that I'll see on a case history. Johnny's been diagnosed with ADD, but we have tried six different medications and none of them seem to be making a difference. He's still struggling in school, particularly with reading and spelling. And <coughs> My first question to a parent writing that would be, if he's gotten that diagnosis somehow or another, and you've tried six different medications, none of which have worked, why are you not questioning whether or not that's an appropriate diagnosis? Because truth be told, the evidence shows, the research shows, folks who truly have an, an attention deficit problem or who have ADHD do, by and large, you know, the vast majority will respond well to medication because it is due to a chemical imbalance in their brain. So if we provide them with medication and it has no impact on what we're seeing, I think that we need to seriously question the validity of the diagnosis. That's just me. Um, plus, I hate to see kids on medication unnecessarily. That's why we have superbugs and viruses and um, rampant MRSA, because we prescribed too many antibiotics for conditions that it was not appropriate for, and now people get sick all the time. That and we don't allow kids to play and get dirty. We, if you have the 
know, the helicopter moms with the, the bat of, of hand sanitizer attached to their backpack when they can hardly walk. My mother said, my aunt said, my grandmother said, you need a pound of dirt before you die. And believe me, they lived it. We played in the sandbox, we played in the dirt, we played in the mud. And just didn't get sick like they did. But anyway, so in addition, we will see that they need frequent repetition. You have to go over it and over it and over for them to get it. A lot of times they will have a degree of hyperacusis, and that is that they are bothered by particular sounds. Um, usually loud sounds, although for some people, they may actually have what's called photophobia, which is a, um, an abnormal response to particular sounds that don't necessarily even have to be loud. Um, there was a, a case study that I was reading about a woman who had photophobia, and hers was to the sound of people eating. So uh, it just it drove her absolutely bananas. Um, just the sounds associated with people chewing and eating. And yet, most of us, I mean, you know, unless someone's really you know, crunching on something, you don't really, you know, I don't really even notice people, you know, they have decent table manners. I don't really notice a whole lot of sound associated with people chewing and eating. Um, but for people who have phonophobia, and that being, and that's one of the common ones, that being there, um, they're extremely tuned into that. Um, but hyperacusis is when they have an abnormal sensitivity to sounds, particularly loud sounds. So um, a sound <coughs> that may be annoying to us would be enough to put them over the edge. Um, there's a kid at my son's school who, um, among other things, has hyperacusis. And they literally, um, thankfully, he has, um, they call it Velcro aid, so he has a one-on-one -on -one, um, teaching aid with him all day long. Um, they have to let her know um, when they're going to have a fire drill or something, and she has to get him out of the building before that alarm goes off. Or if they don't, he's done for the day. I and mean, he will, it, it will be such... Um, a traumatic and devastating experience for him um, when that alarm goes off that he'll be done for the day. They, and they'll, they'll lose him. He's actually had to be taken across the street to the hospital that's across the street and treated in the ER for anxiety and heart palpitations and stuff because he's so sensitive to loud sound. So most of the time it's not that bad, but it can be. Um, they will often complain, and I've heard this from kids as little as six or seven years of age, will say, I can hear people, but I just don't understand what they're saying. And, and so that's, you know, again, their hearing sensitivity is adequate, but they have trouble understanding. Um, they tend to have delayed response to questions or to requests to do something, or they may respond inappropriately. Um, most of you know, because I've shared this in other classes, I had a brain injury as a kid. And to this day, one of the residual effects that I have a problem with is with this. My wife, God love her, now granted, usually we're not having face to face when this happened. She's in the basement with her head in the dryer and I'm up in the bathroom trying to give Will a towel or something so there's two floors between us. Or I'm out in the garage getting stuff out of the freezer and she's in the kitchen yelling at me to get something else. Um, and I'll have to, I know she's talking to me and I'm like, what did she say? And just about the time that I'm ready to ask her what did you say? This is saying, please. Um, it'll click in, 
and I'll get it. So my problem is typically that, that there's a delay. I also have a really hard time with reverberation. This room is not too bad because it's big, but it's not huge. And there's, you know, there's some carpet and there's the, the tiles, so it's usually not an issue. But you put me into a room that's all hard surfaces, no carpeting, nothing to absorb the sound, and you could be sitting as far away from me as where Grace is, and I'm going to have a really hard time understanding what you're saying, particularly if there's noise. So, and that's not at all unusual to see that. Um, a lot of times, their, their responses are somewhat inconsistent, where sometimes they seem like they're really tuned in and listening well, and others time, other times they're not. When I've done some digging in those cases, more often than not, there was something in the auditory environment that had changed, for better or for worse, that could at least in part account for that inconsistency. Kids with auditory processing disorder almost universally have problems with reading and spelling. Why do you think that might be? Okay. <coughs> then if you have school-age kids learning to read, so I'll give you a scenario. I will set it up. Will is sitting at the dining room table. Daddy. How do you spell blah, blah, blah? What's, actually, let's, <coughs> mom, how do I spell blah, blah, blah? And what is Celeste's first response? Will, you've got your dictionary. Look it up. Okay? Will's response is, if I don't know how to spell it, how do you expect me to look it up? <laughs> Brilliant. That's the answer you should be giving to that kind of response. Why would a kid who has auditory processing disorder have a problem with spelling? They can't sound out words. So oh. Yes. And guess what? Eight out of ten of my parents of kids with auditory processing problems, and they're struggling with reading, Ask me if they should get for their kid. Booked on phonics. <coughs> Hello. What is the phonics based approach? <coughs> Matching the letters and the sounds. What can't these kids do? Match the letters to the sounds. So why the flip would we want them <laughs> to be trained to read using an approach that is absolutely the biggest challenge that they're going to face. Um, because by and large, what I have found is that children with an auditory processing disorder, particularly if it's a discrimination um, type of disorder, a perceptual type of disorder, they cannot match letters to sounds. Let me ask you. What sound does that make? <laughs> so it's not O. O is the letter. Okay? <laughs> My point is, you cannot tell, necessarily, the sound that a letter represents. But, okay, so you said this is hop. Now what is it? Oh. What makes it O rather than A? The magic E. <laughs> and that's how... You sometimes have to teach kids who have an auditory processing disorder. You have to teach them that there are rules and relationships that are not necessarily obvious to them. Okay? 
What sound does that make? Yes, but what does it make there? Okay, again, you may not automatically assume the sound that a letter or a letter combination may make. That's why you've seen me do this before. What's that word? Fish. Fish. We have the buh sound, like in tough. We have the i sound, like in women. And we have the sh sound, like in nation. English is a jacked language. <laughs> because if we can get fish from that, and if we follow some of the sound combination rules, we can. Is it any wonder why Will sits at the dining room table from time to time and says, Mom, how do you spell? Okay, here's one of my, I think it's one of the dumbest words in the English language. <coughs> how do we get of, uh, out of, off, or oh? Okay, I mean, come on. How often? Does the letter O make the uh sound? I mean, can you think of a, I mean, nothing immediately comes to mind. I could probably give myself a bruise of the brain trying to think of something, but more, huh? In government, it does make something. Okay, there you go. But, but then, but then why don't we spell it? <laughs> because the, the letter F, which typically makes the sound is a voiceless sound, and yet... I would hate to keep spelling to <laughs> Okay, you get the point. Kids with auditory processing problems are prone to reading and spelling problems. In addition to frequently having ministry of middle ear issues, they will often have poor auditory memory. Well, gee, I wonder why Johnny has a problem with auditory memory. If he can't understand the freaking words that are coming in, and he's distracted by all the sounds, because it's winter and people are coughing and hacking, so we sound like we're in a TV ward. You know, I mean, why does, why does Johnny have trouble? With remembering. Do you remember something that I didn't that you didn't hear me say? <laughs> exactly. I mean, it, I mean, isn't that a stupid that's a stupid statement? I'll, I'll admit it. But that's what's happening. We're expecting kids to remember <coughs> and retain information that they didn't hear in the first place. Okay? Can you understand why I'm frustrated that auditory processing disorder is not a qualifying condition for an IDD? Because guess what typically happens to these kids? The smart ones, which is most of them, figure out enough little tricks, enough little coping strategies, and guess what happens? They get by in school. They're working three times harder than any other kid, and they're getting a C or a C minus to show for it, but they're getting by. And so they don't qualify. They've got the issues, but they are figuring it out because kids are smart. They're figuring out strategies, and they're getting by. And that's usually one of my biggest um, challenges is that, or what makes me feel really bad is these kids, especially as they get a little bit older, the 10, 11, 12 year olds, and they're just now being diagnosed, um, is that they're, they're, they hate school. Not because they don't love to learn, not because they're not interested, 
but because it's so stinking hard. And they realize that they're having to work three times harder than everyone else around them, and they're not getting you know, on the A honor roll when their buddies that hardly ever crack a book are, you know, are doing really well. So I wonder why we then have academic achievement problems. So do you get the, I mean, I don't mean to belabor it, but I think it's really <coughs> important for you to understand this because guess what? It's being diagnosed more and more often Kids with this diagnosis are being referred to speech pathologists more and more often, even in the public school setting. So, you had a question. Why don't those kids get the IEP? I'm sorry? Why don't those kids get IEP? <coughs> we could talk for days. It's just one of those things. Yes. Um, if they do go and get diagnosed for ADHD, do the doctors who diagnose them with that realize, like, if the medication isn't working, do they realize that this is another possible outcome? Or um, it's getting better. The, the awareness is getting better. What, what typically tends to happen is that um, an audiologist starts building a relationship with a particular pediatrician. Um, is that who does the diagnosis for you? Typically, typically the pediatrician will, or at least will be the one that says, I think this is it, let's go get it checked out. So then what happens is, the parents come back and they're like, look, you know, they, they said maybe ADD, or they said yes, but we tried these medications and nothing's working. I really, I'm starting to wonder if there's something else going on. And some, by hook or by crook, some way or another, they'll tune into something that's being auditory, and the doctor will say, oh, why don't we get this hearing checked? Or, why don't we do, um, you know, so we get the hearing checked, and we say, oh, you know what, your hearing's fine. But I'm wondering, I'm seeing some signs and symptoms, maybe it's a processing problem, so we see that, we do the auditory processing evaluation, we send that to the physician, physician has an epiphany and says, wow, and says, you know, hey, I've got these three kids, and that's exactly what happened to me at Snowball. One, a pediatrician in one of the largest pediatrics practices in northern Kentucky, that's what happened, and he started really thinking about it, looking at his kids, and he referred over the course of a three-month period, 20 of his patients to us, and they were only ones that medications just Really didn't, he didn't refer to everybody, but just once where they had the diagnosis or they had a possible diagnosis that meds were not working. And out of those kids, all three had an auditory processing problem. Two of them had a visual processing problem, and one was later placed high level on the spectrum. So, anyway. <coughs> Poor listening. Academic <coughs> problems, reading and spelling issues, bothered by sounds, need frequent repetition. You know, I mean, these are things that you just you see over and over and over again in the history. So you said most people don't think that, or some people don't think that this is a disorder. Do, if, do more audiologists like, think that this actually is a problem? Yes. Okay, so. Audiologists, by and large, okay. very few of them. Like I said, there are a few old schools that they say, no, it's all language. Um, put it this way, you guys are, some of you, not the back row over there, but some of you will be on, not a couple over here either, um, will be applying to graduate school in the near future. Closer than you think. Um, there's a program very close by to here, I won't say the name of the initials, or you see. Um, <laughs> there's a huge huge battle amongst their faculty. About half of them are auditory processing is a misnomer, it's all language. And then there's another camp that are very staunchly, no, it really does exist. And not every person who has an auditory processing problem has language issues. 
And that's why we say, because it can, it can exist distinctly. People can develop coping strategies and um, compensatory strategies so that it doesn't impact their language. And yet, we can see very clearly that there are abnormalities in their auditory pathways. But we can also see people who have these abnormalities who also then have significant language issues or mild or whatever. Um, but, it, you know, so in some programs, even, it's a really, it's a huge battle. Like you will see people arguing about it. It's kind of entertaining to watch sometimes. <laughs> Dr. Kelly tried to get me and one of our faculty members who thinks it's bunk going the other day at lunch. She goes, I just want to stir it up and see what happens. <laughs> I'm not going to have a discussion. You gotta love Dr. Kelly because she she just she has a sense of humor that if you get it, she's one of your favorite people around. And if you don't get it, forget. Uh, I'm lucky because I actually had her as an instructor. She was one of my doctoral facilitators, so I knew her first as as a professor before I knew her as a colleague. Um, and it was during that period of time that she actually was instrumental in getting me on faculty here, so I owe her a lot, but, um, but yeah, because we do have, we have one person in particular who's starting to come around, but is still pretty staunchly not a believer, and so Dr. Kelly was really trying to get us stirred up. What are like, the main differences to differentiate auditory versus language? From, from language disorders? Well, for me, the first thing is um, I think it's wrong to say um, differentiate that I'm not criticizing you, but because there are a lot of people who do. I say it's wrong to try and differentiate them because it's not necessarily that they're mutually exclusive. Um, so what I, what I say is, if we have evidence of <coughs> test results, abnormalities in the auditory pathway, they have AP. Okay? They may, if they have receptive language or other language processing issues, they have that. Some people have both. Some have one or the other. And they have both. But, and to me, that's why we can't say that it doesn't exist. Because we have a large pool of people who have abnormalities of the auditory pathway. And yet they're not showing necessarily functional deficits in language. They may have a difficult time discriminating sound. Um, they may have problems with tolerance of sound. But that doesn't equate to a problem with language, per se. Um, so, very good question. Your question is great. So, I don't want to be like that. No, no, that but, but to me, I think that when people say that, it shows a lack of understanding of the relationship. Because you can have one or the other, or you can have both. And I think the people who the people who aren't firm believers don't see that distinction. They say that it's sort of a cause and effect. That if you have these auditory abnormalities, then, and they're having language issues, that it's a language issue, not an auditory issue. And my argument is, but what do you do with the people then that have the auditory abnormalities but don't have them? There are those folks out there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I just want to find a song over here. I must be happy with you. <laughs> all right. Um, in adults, the profile tends to be a little bit different. Um, and like I said, I'm not necessarily the firmest of believers 
that this profile, particularly the top thin one, this profile, um, is necessarily what I would consider a true auditory processing disorder. But there are a lot of people who do, and so I lay it out there for you to decide for yourself. I don't want you to be influenced by my bias, other than the fact that and it's not my bias, I'm telling you what the research says. The research says it does exist. So if we can accept that and move on from there, now I'll tell you, my bias is that if you have hearing loss, if so facto, you're going to have problems with understanding and discrimination and some of these other skills. But it's because of the hearing loss, not because of problems in the auditory pathway which is what I say auditory processing disorders. But there are those who will say that, um, particularly in adults, if you have a long-standing history of untreated hearing loss, you will have processing problems. I don't disagree, but I don't think that that meets the definition. If you read a lot of the accepted definitions, then they have hearing loss. Um, Typically, again, a primary complaint is difficulty understanding, particularly in noise. That's every single adult patient that walks into my office. I can hear what people are saying, I can't make out. I can hear people, but I can't make out what they're saying. Everybody moans. No, everybody does not moan. If people would just learn diction like they did when I was a kid, I'd be able to understand. I could hear just fine. No, you can't hear just fine. And if, even if they spoke clearly, because I'll say to them, you, are you understanding me? No, you sound like you moan. And I truly make a concerted effort. For those of you who've been with me, you know, I make a very concerted effort to very clearly articulate what I'm saying. Make good eye contact. Sit in close proximity. I'm giving them you know, the five-star communication enhancement experience, and they still <laughs> say that I'm wrong. So, anyway, difficulty with um, understanding in the way again, disproportionate amount of difficulty with speech understanding <coughs> compared to their hearing loss, and pretty much all those other things that we've seen earlier. These two, I think, are very important. Difficulty with retaining lists or sequences. They miss some of what's said. They get the first and the last thing on the list, and they have trouble with some of them in the middle. This is why I say to Celeste, don't call me and leave me a voicemail to pick up X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and D at the store on the way home. Send me a text message that says, pick up X, Y, and Z, A, B, C, and D on your way home. Because chances are I'm probably driving while I'm listening to your message to begin with. So I'm already distracted enough. I don't need to be looking down for a pen and writing it on my hand and driving with my knees so that I can write down what you said and then have to repeat the message four times. No, just send me a text message so that then I have, oh, you need me to get, and I can actually be tooling my way through Kroger and, and picking up the items. So I, I do, I know I have problems with, with retaining lists of information. The people who say that everyone mumbles, I say, this is the problem. They are inattentive to the speech of others. They don't know how to listen. They've forgotten. Because they haven't heard for so long. Okay? So, anyway. I have, oh, I love getting into debates with my patients with hearing loss. They've got more excuses than Quaker has oats. <laughs> and I've got more sprinkles than the, the 
good humor guy. Jesus. I'll, I'll naturally complain for complaining. So, what no one has asked, and what I thought you were going to ask, was you asked about the language processing, I'm not sure how to say this, how do we differentiate ADHD or ADD from auditory processing disorders? And there are some distinct differences. Folks with attention deficit, whether it's with or without the H, tend to be inattentive. <coughs> they tend to be distractible in general. Uh, they may be hyperactive. They do tend to be fidgety or restless. They're always moving around and they need stuff. You know, they're, they're, they're chewing on their hair. And, you know, they're, they're poking the person in front of them. And, uh, yeah, they're just they're constantly in, in motion. They tend to respond or act hastily or impulsively. They're the ones that may ask, try to answer the question before the teacher's even finished asking the entire question. And so what happens is they blurt out an answer and it's wrong because they didn't listen to the whole question. They were too impulsive. So as a result, kids who have ADD tend to be described as rude or intrusive or constantly interrupting. Okay? I'm getting a head shake in the back from somebody <coughs> who's in the school placement right now. So, if you don't believe me, believe someone who's living it day in and day out. Okay. Our kids with APD on the other hand, they are typically inattentive in noisy or difficult listening situations. They're overwhelmed. So they tend to kind of go off into their own little world. But it's because of the noise. They have difficulty following oral directions. Now, if you give them written directions that are simple, you know, simply stated, they'll do it just fine. Okay? They do have poor listening skills because they're having difficulty focusing they don't know for sure sometimes what's really important. Is it the hum and buzz of the projector? Is it the rush or the whoosh of the air coming out of this vent right here? Is it the little side conversations or the noise of their classmates that they're making? Or is it the teacher's voice? Or is it someone out in the hall or the traffic? There's all the, and it's, they just, there's so much going on, they, they can't focus in on what's important. And they may not even know for sure what is important. Okay? So as a result, we will often see academic achievement problems. They may get distracted and fidgety, but it's typically in noise. You give them a quiet place, and something to work on, and they can do it for hours. And they will. And parents will say that. I don't understand it. They say he doesn't pay attention in school, and he doesn't listen in school, and yet he can sit down and put together his Lego you know, Star Wars model that's designed for kids 12 and up, and he's 8, and I'm, okay, yeah, the disconnect here. Um, they may be inattentive, but again, it's in noise. These kids, though, in the classroom tend to be quiet, passive, and they're like on the edge of their seat. They often get overlooked by the teacher because they're typically not disruptive. They typically are not jumping in and ooh, ooh, ooh. Why? Because experiences told them, you're going to be wrong. You didn't hear that correctly. And what happens, particularly to boys, they start making fun of by the classmates. So what do they do? They zip it. So more often than not, your kid with auditory processing disorder is not going to be the disruptive kid in the class. It's going to be the one that's really trying, but not succeeding, who may 
the more difficult the listening environment is on any given day, the less focused they may seem. Okay? So there are some things that are similar, but there, if you really look at the situation, there's like a night and day difference between the symptoms of attention deficit and the symptoms of auditory processing. These are the ones that mom will say, I don't understand it. We practice um, and review his work at home, you know, with just the two of us, and he does fine. And then the next day in school, he can't remember it. Or he, the teacher says, he doesn't understand. So I don't know if he's just not focused or if he can't remember. Or what. I'm like, well, because he was in a quiet, one-on-one -on -one situation with you at home. Now he's thrown into a classroom with 30 other kids and a really poor signal to noise ratio because there's so much background noise. So when I see things like that in the history, and I see it a lot, it really reinforces to me. I typically try not to read the history before I do the evaluation. So that because that was that was the day <coughs> for a while. I was getting accused by a particular school district in northern Kentucky of being biased. So I would tell the parents to fill out the paperwork and I would look at it until I was done. I would just say, okay, what are your concerns? And they would say, well, we're here because they think he has a processing problem. Um, or I would say to them, are you you're here because you're concerned about a processing problem? And I wouldn't really go into a whole lot. I do my testing, then I interpret the results, and then I sit down and I start supplementing, and it helps me determine um, whether or not we have the problem. Then that way I could legitimately say to this one particular special ed director that I wish she would take a flying leap, um, <laughs> that I'm not going into it biased because she, she made the accusation that um, nine out of 10 kids that we refer to you give them that diagnosis. Well, that's because I have worked with and know and have educated your speech pathologists and they're good about making appropriate referrals. And would you, if you're the special ed director of a school district and you've got speech pathologists and teachers referring kids for specialized testing that you're going to have to pay for, don't you want to have a pretty good hit rate? I'm thinking you want to make sure that they're doing their job and referring kids appropriately. But anyway, so they're not necessarily as closely aligned as one might think. Now, where's the speech part? That's This is supposed to say speech pathologist right there, um, but it obviously doesn't. Um, the audiologist is the only one who can diagnose an auditory processing disorder. OTs try to, neuropsychologists try to, but the only individual is within their scope of practice to assess and describe the integrity of the auditory pathways is the audiologist. As a result, the audiologist is the one who can diagnose an auditory processing disorder. We're going to look at hearing sensitivity and the integrity of the auditory pathways we're going to make recommendations for interventions and accommodations, and we'll refer to other professionals as necessary. The speech pathologist is going to evaluate the impact of, and you can even put in parentheses if you want, suspected auditory processing disorder um, on language. And they may then work on interventions to compensate or remediate those deficits. And they too may make recommendations and interventions. 
and they too may refer to other professionals. So my concern as the audiologist is the integrity of those pathways and whether or not we have functional deficits related to that. The speech pathologist is concerned with language and the potential impact that that processing problem may have on language. Okay? So fairly distinct roles. Um, yes? I have a random question. I know a lot of the time you don't know the cause, but do you believe it's something that can be congenital? Um, I do because nine times out of ten, as I'm going over the results with the parents, one or the other of them will say, oh my gosh, that's me, or oh my gosh, that's my brother Joe, oh my gosh, that's my dad, that's my dad, my uncle and 16 of my... 24 cousins. I mean, <laughs> seriously, it, it, so it does tend. There is a tendency to see it running in families, is the quick answer. Okay? Alright, so, again, I don't know what happens by labels here. Um, the one on your left is audiologist, or it is, is the basic auditory. Um, battery, and then um, over here is the language uh, inventory. Huh? <coughs> the left one is your auditory battery. The right one is your language battery. Okay? So the audiologist is going to do otoscopy, tympanometry, acoustic reflexes. Why acoustic reflexes? So they tell us about integrity of the auditory pathways. Um, we will do otoacoustic emissions. Why? Is that a test of cochlear function? Why would we do OAEs? Because we want to rule out inner and outer hair cell dysfunction. Because guess what that causes? Even if hearing thresholds are normal, it causes discrimination problems. So we want to know. Um, then we will do our comprehensive evaluation of air. We'll do speech in both quiet and in noise. Why? Why both? Because we should see. So we can, yes, we can see if there's a difference. Typically, and quiet, how are they going to perform? Fine. Typically, how are they going to perform when we give them a less than ideal signal to noise ratio? They're going to suck. And what we're looking for is we go from quiet to a signal to noise ratio of plus eight or worse. If we see more than a 10% drop in discrimination, that's a red flag. Now, plus 8 signal to noise ratio, what does that mean? If I say that I'm doing word discrimination testing, but plus 8 signal to noise ratio, which is louder? signal or the noise. Plus 8 signal, which is loud. The speech is 8 decibels louder than the background. Okay. Normal, people with normal hearing sensitivity and normal processing skills can typically have less than a 10% drop in their discrimination, all the way down to a zero signal to noise ratio, meaning that the noise and the speech are at the same loudness. Normals can tolerate that. So to me, if 
I'm seeing a problem at plus 8, a problem. But anyway, guess what your <coughs> typical signal to noise ratio is in an average classroom? Anywhere from negative 3 to plus 3. Meaning that the teacher's voice is anywhere from 3 decibels softer for the background noise to only 3 decibels louder. Guess what signal to noise ratio children with hearing loss typically need? At least plus 10. And I really haven't been there. Guess what signal to noise ratio children with learning disabilities tend to plus 10 at a minimum. And what level is? Oh, and this is the kicker. The typical classroom is negative 3 to plus 3. Guess what the average signal to noise ratio is in the hearing impaired classroom if they happen to have a So, we will then, in addition to doing teaching and five things, we're going to do binaural tasks. We're going to do separation, but we're looking at the ability to selectively listen. So, we might have them listen and we're putting one sentence in this ear and one sentence in this ear, and we're telling them ahead of time, only tell me what you hear in your right ear. And we'll do the <coughs> words, it might be. Um, sentences, but they have to separate and, and only tune in to one particular signal. We might do the opposite, where we look at integration and we present signals to both ears and we tell them, tell us everything that you heard. Okay? We will look at temporal processing, which is their ability to identify patterns of sounds, it could be durational patterns, it could be pitch patterns, it could be de uh, gap detection, where they're able to tell the difference between sounds. And then we will typically do some sort of electrophysiological testing, whether it be ABR, the ASSR, the middle latency response, or the auditory late response. But we typically try and combine testing that's objective, like reflexes, tokenometry, OAEs, and the electrophysiologic, as well as behavioral tests, like those ones in the speech pathologist, on the other hand, is going to incorporate into their language assessment for language processing issues. They're going to look at auditory memory, auditory closure. What's auditory closure? Can they fill in appropriately this information? There's someone at the door. Yeah. Or um, I like peanut butter and <coughs> you, close it where you can actually fill in. Or I went to the and got some milk. You guys have good auditory closure skills. So it's the ability to close the gap if there's missing information. Makes sense. Auditory cohesion. What is auditory cohesion? Key things like making inferences, uh, finding associations between words and sounds. Uh, we'll typically have them look at phonemic and phonological awareness, sound blending, segmenting, and discrimination skills. We'll look at auditory comprehension. We'll look at inferential thinking or you know, reasoning skills, and auditory figure graph, which is also a form of 
listening with background noise. Okay? So pretty distinct roles and responsibilities. We're going to stop there. <laughs> the papers three to five pages, right? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.